We have things growing on trees or out of the ground available, if not freely, then certainly very cheaply, which could be very useful tools in things like this um, pandemic that are simply being neglected, sidelined, ignored. And why in hell at the beginning of this pandemic didn't governments throw money at people doing research like this? They should have been throwing it hand over fist because if this something like elderberry proves to be as useful as it looks like it might be, or any of the other plants being researched, then you've literally got a medicine that grows on trees that is a renewable resource that can be produced for very low cost and distributed quite easily to most of, of the world. Hello, this is Marcos Patchett, the Nocturnal Herbalist, and today's video, despite the title, it's going to be a lot less angsty than that sounds. It's actually hopefully quite a positive video because, as some of you may know, I did a video in 2020 called Herbs or Herbs for COVID or Herbal Medicine in COVID-19, something along those lines. I've linked it up here, which was just a video reviewing some of the herbal medicines that might be useful in COVID. And since then, there's been some research that's come out in 2021 and even the year before in 2020, since I did that video, which really sort of substantiates some of those recommendations and added a couple more to the pile. So I'm going to be reviewing those. But the reason for the title of this video is it really refers to an issue that I, as a medical herbalist, as a complementary practitioner, am acutely aware of and have been aware of all the time. And it sort of creates a low level background anger <laughs> that many complementary practitioners will be very familiar with. Um, and I think what this pandemic has done is really brought it into focus for far more people. It sort of unveiled the elephant in the room for many people. And that is the potential for profit and profit profiteering essentially to distort and corrupt medical recommendations and to really sort of remove, like dis take away impartiality in, in medical recommendations. Um, I'm not putting that very well, but I'll, I'll hopefully, I'll, I'll go into more detail as the, as the video goes on. I just want to open with a couple of basic definitions, and then I'm going to go into a bit more detail about research on some herbs, uh, particularly focusing on elderberry and then into other herbal medicines uh, in terms of uh, that research supporting their potential utility in COVID-19. As usual, any references uh, will be linked below in the description box in YouTube. There'll be all the receipts, all the research information um, will be linked on YouTube. So any claims that I might be making are going to be substantiated uh, by peer-reviewed research um, or any any other I'll, I'll be trying to be as clear as I can about where any information or claims are coming from if it's just traditional use or if it's uh, research based or, or whatnot um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of complementary medicine in terms of the sort of the legislation that's affected it um, uh, sort of like by way of a little digression, a tangent, um, which which hopefully will be, you'll see what the relevance is as the video goes on. So, all right, that's that's enough of a preamble. Let me get into it. So the two definitions I want to start with are, first of all, to define something called the precautionary principle. Um, it is what it sounds like, but let me read a little definition for you. I'll whack it on the screen as well. And that definition is taken from an article in a handbook of toxicologic pathology, 
and it states that the precautionary principle is based on the long-standing ethical premise of medicine primo non nocere, which translates as first do no harm. That, I believe, is a quote from Hippocrates, and it forms part of the Hippocratic Oath that all doctors and medical personnel must take before going into practice. It's better to not do something or to do nothing than to produce damage. Uh, and then I'm just going to skip the next bit and go on to the, the next paragraph. The precautionary principle is a highly ethical statement which, when taken literally, provides a very conservative approach to risk and in its strict application may impede the development of solutions to health problems. The strict application of the precautionary principle does not permit inclusion of acceptable risk. So, OK, hopefully that's clear enough. In other words, it's like be very, really careful when you're prescribing medicine that you don't harm people. Now, if you are going to be super strict about applying the precautionary principle, then really you'd never prescribe anything because all medicines carry some measure of risk. So the precautionary principle is usually combined with something else that we're familiar with, which is called the risk benefit ratio. That is like a filter that's applied to the precautionary principle. And risk-benefit ratio, again, it is what it sounds like. Uh, what are the risks of any given medicine or treatment or procedure and what are the potential benefits? And obviously you want the potential benefits to greatly outweigh the risks, depending on the context. So it really depends how much there is to lose in a given situation. So if you're applying a treatment to someone in relatively good health or in a non, relatively non-serious medical situation, you would want a very wide risk-benefit ratio. In other words, you want low risk and good evidence of benefit. If somebody's already sort of on the ropes, uh, maybe they, they've got a terminal diagnosis or a really serious medical diagnosis, then it's considered more acceptable to have a sort of narrower risk-benefit ratio. Uh, in other words, the risks of the treatment might be much higher um, because there's sort of less to lose in a sense. And obviously there's there's huge ethical minefield in this area, but essentially that filter is applied. So what you want to make sure in general is that any treatment, your, your, your primary is the precautionary principle, but then as secondary, you're also filtering that with the risk benefit ratio. So that's just a background. And I think the issue I want to sort of, I want you to bear in mind here is that often profit may distort this filtering ability <laughs> for obvious reasons. There's something often called the file draw effect as well, which is when studies are published, um, several of them, if they're, whether they're positive or negative, may end up never being published. They're sort of kept in the file drawer if they contradict some sort of narrative. So say if you have uh, some sort of big money funding research into a particular treatment, then very often what is published is not going to be accurately reflective of what all the totality of the research has said. Uh, because m a lot of that research may never uh, sort of be exposed to the light of day. It may never come out in public. There was a book released a number of years ago by uh, the journalist Ben Goldacre, who I think writes for the Guardian newspaper in the UK. He's no fan of complementary medicine, so he wouldn't be a supporter of what I do as a herbalist. He considered me very much on the hippie end. And my, my, my other sort of um, career as an astrologer, he definitely think was a total write-off. But that book... I can't remember the name of it, but I'll, I'll put the title on the screen. He did a book about the bit, the issues present in Big Pharma and, and some of these, some of these uh, sort of issues. Um, one of the problems is that, that this sort of thing of, about Big Pharma and, and the sort of corruption in medicine has been labelled a conspiracy theory for many, many years. And that to me is deeply irritating because it isn't, a theory, nor is it a conspiracy. It is simple fact. Yes, it's sometimes overstated. And yes, it absolutely can be used to justify 
the provision of treatments with, let's say, very low levels of proof. Because um, I'm not saying that the existence of these this kind of corruption means that all complementary practitioners, there aren't any problems on that side. That's a specious argument. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that there's definitely corruption and distortion of information available to the public on the pharmaceutical side. And I think anyone with two eyes in their head and a functional brain should be able to have seen that, at least to some degree, in the last couple of years. In terms of why elderberry makes me angry? The reason for this is, as I outlined in my video in 2020, there is a fair amount of medical research on the value of elderberry in viral infections. And elderberry has an excellent safety record. If you don't eat, if you eat the berries fresh, they contain cyanide containing compounds, as I discussed in my previous video. So if you eat too many of them, they can make you very sick. But once the elderberries are dried and cooked, so made into a syrup or just even dried and made into a tincture or, or, or taken as a powder, that most of the cyanide containing compounds break down. So it's actually a very, very safe remedy. It grows on trees, <laughs> as you might imagine. It's abundantly available. And some of the research that's come out in the last year is, 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 is very, very interesting. What I would like you to think about is why, given the wide abundance of this plant, its very high level of safety, and the likelihood, given what information we have in terms of its long traditional use in respiratory tract viral infections, or viral infections of the respiratory tract, and the pharmaceutical, uh, the pharmacological and the small clinical trials I outlined in my video in 2020 and the ones I'm going to be detailing today, why was it not pushed more, as in advertised more, as in suggested to people more during this pandemic? Because here's the thing, we know that it doesn't have the sort of gold standard clinical proof thing going for it. But I'll talk a bit more about that as the video goes on. Um, that's true, but <laughs> it doesn't have placebo controlled human double blind clinical trials in COVID. However, there are two trials going on currently. One I know is from the, um, I think, East Kent Hospital in the UK. Um, and the other is um, run by a bunch of researchers in Iran. And I'll put screenshots of those two on the screen while I'm talking. I've been in contact with both of these groups of researchers. Um, the East Kent Hospital lot I uh, got back to me and said the trial is still ongoing. They don't have all the data. Bear in mind, this is supposed to be have been going on since March 2020. And uh, the Ar Iranian researchers completed their research last year in 2021, but still haven't got it published. Now, I can't blame the organisers of this research because there is often very little funding made available to researchers into herbal medicine. Basically, with herbal medicine, you're not going to get you ha then they're not patentable unless you produce a specific extract from a plant. You can patent the process, but you can't patent the plant. But you could pay patent a specific extract, but then a competitor could come along, make a few tweaks to that, just do a slightly different extract. As long as it contains the quote unquote active ingredients, they could just um, undercut your profits and produce a similar thing. So there are very low or, or very little profits to be made from plant medicines. And the cost of doing a really rigorous double blind placebo controlled clinical trial and producing the number of those that the volume of evidence that's required to really prove something works is, is astronomical. So there's very little financial incentive. So these guys who are putting together these small trials uh, are basically doing them with very little funding. So the thing that makes me very angry as a herbalist, and it should, I think, make many of you angry too, if you spend just a minute thinking about this, is we have plants, and elderberry is one of several plants, I'm going to talk about a few now, which may have 
um, useful activity in COVID-19, at the very least. I'm not saying they might be a cure, I'm not saying they might be a solution, but they certainly look like they would have utility. And given their good safety profile, they do not violate the precautionary principle, and they certainly have a good risk-benefit ratio from all the evidence we have so far. Yes, they're not proven, but here's the catch-22. You can't say there is no evidence, therefore we're not going to use it. Oh, we need proof that they're useful. Oh, but there's no... So the, the argument that's often used is we're not going to fund this research because there's no evidence that it works there's no evidence that it works, so we're not going to use it. And the thing that makes me angrier than anything else is we could have, and I believe we certainly do, given the amount of plants growing worldwide and the, the incredible chemistry of many different medicinal plants, we have things growing on trees or out of the ground available if not freely, then certainly very cheaply, which could be very useful tools in things like this um, pandemic that are simply being neglected, sidelined, ignored. And why in hell at the beginning of this pandemic didn't governments throw money at people doing research like this? They should have been throwing it hand over fist because if this something like elderberry proves to be as useful as it looks like it might be, or any of the other plants being researched, then you've literally got a medicine that grows on trees, that is a renewable resource that can be produced for very low cost and distributed quite easily to most of, of the world. So um, instead, what we've, what we've done is spent billions developing a new, untested, potentially risky technology. Um, I'm not saying that the current vaccination programs are bad. I've done a whole video about my thoughts on the vaccination thing, which you can watch if you want to. But it just, it's what, it, irrespective of what you think about the current treatment option, that the mainstream, the sort of thing that's pushed constantly, the vaccination, irrespective of what you think about that, it is to me absolutely fundamentally outrageous that these things haven't been funded and haven't been uh, lifted up and, and, and given air by, and, and money by governments and other people. If this is as much of as an emergency uh, situation as we're told, as we're constantly told that it is, why in hell hasn't that been done? Anyway, you can hear my frustration. That's the thing. That's something that as a medical herbalist, I've long been aware of. And I think just the pandemic has really thrown it into relief. Let me just start by looking at some of the research that's been done since uh, my last video in 2020. So this is a little paper um, about the use of herbal adjuvants, that means side treatments or um, co-treatments in COVID-19, a paper by Silvera and colleagues um, in 2020. And they found a, they did a risk benefit assessment for many plants and found a very positive risk benefit assessment for several plants in COVID, including elderberry and licorice, two herbs that I discussed quite thoroughly in my video in 2020. Um, now this paper did, it was very cautious to sort of like about the way it was making claims. Remember this was released in 2020, so the censorship powers were strong. They're still kind of there, but they were really, you know, people were uh, very, very cautious about what they're saying, quite rightly then, I think, in the sense that you don't want to jump the gun and tell people to take stuff which might be harmful. So, But they said um, it, that in this paper, they defined COVID as a mostly mild self-limiting condition, which was interesting to me, and therefore appropriate for over-the-counter remedies. So they weren't saying it was always mild and self-limiting. We know that the people have died and it's been it can lead to SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, particularly the earlier variants of, of COVID, like the Delta variant and so on. But they were saying for the most people, it's similar to a flu or a self-limiting respiratory tract infection. Um, 
and they wanted in this paper to highlight the plants which would be the best choices and clinically compatible with any treatments that were offered. Um, and they, they also said that it was for a self-management of cold and flu symptoms during the pandemic. <laughs> so it was kind of mealy-mouthed. They were saying, oh, it's for cold and flu in the pandemic. But the paper was clearly aimed at these plants could be useful in the actual co-treatment of COVID. Um, so that it's interesting that they, they listed a few. The elderberry and licorice, which I, I discussed in my video in 2020, were uh, given a positive risk-benefit ratio and promising for um, echinacea, which was another one. And they, they listed several others that, that the paper I've linked, I've linked be below. They also uh, tested the conventional medicines, ibuprofen, paracetamol and codeine, which of course would not be expected to have any curative benefit, but might relieve pain or reduce fever or whatever. Uh, and they found that ibuprofen was promising out of those. And of course, that would be because it, 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 it's an anti-inflammatory. So it might actually have some benefit in reducing some of the harm caused by excessive inflammation, uh, which we know can be induced by COVID. So, uh, And then the, the, the quote from the paper was, our work suggests that several herbal remedies, several herbal medicines have safety margins superior to those of reference drugs and enough levels of evidence to start a clinical discussion about their potential use as adjuvants in the treatment of early and mild common flu in otherwise healthy adults in the context of COVID-19. So they're being very careful to distance themselves from making claims, but what they're essentially saying is these plants might be useful. Um, and and in, that, in that paper, they really focused on the symptoms that might be induced, such as cough, pain, and fever. Um, so anyway, and they, interestingly and rather irritatingly to me, they excluded anybody who had a positive COVID test from it, which is really annoying. Um, presumably because they they were being so careful not to make any claims for those plants they didn't want to include anyone who actually had covid but this was 2020 remember so a lot of people in the trial would have had covid but may not have had access to tests at the time so there were there are presumably people in that trial in that analysis who would have had covid but just wouldn't have been diagnosed with it so it's kind of a an arm's length um sort of almost an endorsement but certainly so that's it's peripheral but that was interesting that came out shortly after i i released my video in 2020 um so there were a few other bits i wanted to talk about so the, the next thing just moving on to elderberry some of the stuff that's come out since my 2020 video on elderberry which i discussed the evidence for its potential use in covid19 in that video so i'm not going to go over all that again but i am just going to talk about additional studies that have come out since then so this was a study by harnett and colleagues released in 2020 on the effects of sambucus nigra berry that's elderberry on acute respiratory viral infections and this was a rapid review of clinical studies in other words a kind of meta-analysis where they review all the extant information and they found that um the there was a reduction of influenza type symptoms such as fever headache cough uh, fever headache congestion and nasal mucus and or cough when elderberry was taken within 48 hours of symptom onset. This is important and I believe I, I said this in, in, my, in my video in 2020 as well. With elderberry it's very important to start taking it right at the beginning of the infection before it gets serious um, because it's an antiviral effectively. So you want it's got some anti-inflammatory activity as well but you really want it to reduce the replication of the virus. If the virus is really settled in and set up a bunch of really strong inflammatory symptoms it might be too late. So early days the sooner you can start taking it the better um so they in this paper they determined that when elderberry was taken from all these trials together within two to four days most participants experienced significant symptom reduction by an average of 50 percent and the interesting thing was that adverse drug events were more common in the comparators in other words the people taking placebo had side effects more often than the people taking elderberry in when they pooled all these trials together. Now, 
These trials were all for flu or cold, not for COVID. But remember, flus and colds are caused by different viruses. You've got influenza viruses causing flu. Colds can be caused by other coronaviruses, etc. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 that that was an interesting little sort of um, uh, sort of backup. I think perhaps the most interesting paper that came out uh, was by Borodusky and colleagues in 2021. And it was entitled Wild Sambucus nigra from the northeast edge of the species, species range, a valuable germplasm with inhibitory capacity against SARS-CoV-2 S protein receptor binding domain and ACE2 binding in vitro. Let me translate. This is an in vitro study, meaning just in the laboratory. So you can't generalize the results to humans. My argument as a herbalist is that given that this plant has a very long history of use in viral infections, particularly respiratory viral infections, and given that it's also demonstrated utility in clinical trials against other upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract viral infections in terms of clinical efficacy and reducing the duration and severity of symptoms, um, it's very interesting and suggestive that what they showed in this research, that extracts of elderberry had an inhibitory effect against COVID in the Petri dish and did so by inhibiting the spike protein. It stopped the spike protein from being able to function, to, to which its main function is to enable it to bind to the cells it infects, stopped it being able to stick to it to cells and infect them. And it also blocked one of the receptors, the ACE2 receptor, it stopped the COVID-19 from being able to dock onto that receptor. Uh, and they used, I mean, there are some technical details, which you, if you want to find, you can read the whole paper. Like they used ELISA tests and it talks about all the technical stuff for, for anyone who's interested in that. Uh, and they, they, they really, they, they were sort of um, taking this elderberry from wild populations in Latvia and they found that the wild elderberry had a stronger effect in this regard than cultivated elderberry, which also had the same property. But that's often, not always, but often the case with medicinal plants, that the wild plants, presumably because they have to struggle more to survive, so they produce more defensive plant compounds, uh, they may be more medicinal than cultivated plants. It's not always the case. There are some exceptions. I can think of some herbs like angelica root, for example, that are more medicinal when they're grown in the garden than they are when they're wild, but in general. I found some research from a few years ago in a book that I own called Phytopharmacy uh, that was released. It's a book that was released in 2015 uh, and it's um, a sort of co-authored collation of various bits of clinical evidence on various different plants. It's called An Evidence-Based Guide to Herbal Medicinal Products. It's uh, published by Wiley Blackwell. Uh, details the, the um, uh, bibliographic references in the description box on YouTube. I found this absolutely fascinating. Here's what it said about elderberry. And again, this is in the laboratory, tests in the laboratory. Elderberry extracts have antimicrobial and antiviral activity against both gram-positive and negative bacteria, as well as an influenza, as well as influenza viruses. Here's the important bit. Its constituents neutralize the activity of the hemagglutinin spikes found on the surface of several viruses, which are vital for virus replication. This is from a paper about elderberry published in 2015. So the paper was actually published earlier than that. The book was published in 2015. Just think about the implications of that for a moment. It means we've known certainly before the pandemic that the spike proteins on the surface of several viruses, which incidentally, the vaccines are designed to cause people to manufacture. We've known that those spike proteins are hemagglutinating. In other words, they cause or potentially cause clotting. That's interesting. Um, but what's also interesting is we know that elderberry, at least in the laboratory, 
neutralizes the effects of those. And from the research I just mentioned previously, that research done in 2021, we can see that yes, elderberry does that for SARS-CoV-2, at least in the laboratory as well. So that's fascinating, I thought. All right, I just wanna go into a bit of a digression, as I said at the beginning of the video I would, into the history of the legislation surrounding herbal medicine. Now I'm gonna be focusing on the legislation in America, not because the legislation in the UK and Europe and the rest of the world isn't important, it's just because America has led the way in terms of sort of being an intellectual thought leader for the 20th century when a lot of these laws were created. I mean, there's a saying in the UK, when America sneezes, Britain catches a cold. It's been very much like that politically for pretty much the whole of the 20th century. So that's hence the focus on America because what, what America does legally or even social, socially, very often the rest of the quote unquote Western world follows suit. So um, the, the main thing I want to look at is this uh, really important uh, historical document called the Flexner Report, um, which was named after Abraham Flexer, Flexner, who was a school teacher who was sort of employed to put this report together in 1910, I think, uh, sort of the early 20th century. Um, so I've, I've used a few references here. The first one I'm going to be talking about is a paper by Starnish and Verhoeff, in 2012, a uh, reference in the description box on YouTube, uh, called the Flexner Report of 2010. And they described the sort of the thoughts going into this report as like, to, they, they say, uh, quoting to Flexner, all non-biomedical approaches were illegitimate and non-scientific. So already the person commissioned to put the report together had a strong bias against all other forms of medicine in America at the time. And his report was really uh, commissioned into the schools, the schools teaching medicine in America. Um, I'll get on to who commissioned it and why in a moment. But essentially, in addition to allopathic medicine, which is what we now know as mainstream biomedicine, uh, there were other major schools doing quite well in America at the time. There were naturopathic schools, homeopathic schools, chiropractic schools, osteopathic schools, eclectic schools, and schools of physical therapy. The eclectics were particularly interesting to me as a herbalist because they practiced a really, in my view, evolved, advanced form of herbal medicine it was very scientific, very research-based, very pharmacologically sort of that um, they combined um, the sort of observation, empirical observation of how plants affected people to an almost homeopathic level of detail, but not not with quite so much esotericism as the homeopaths, not with sort of like, you know, homeopathic sort of prescriptions are, you know, the patient is pale at midnight and uh, is, is re revolted by the smell of bread, you know, that level of detail. The eclectics are more like they would give an, a medicine at a normal physiological pharmaceutically active dosage of a plant and then observe things like the pulse rate, pupil dilation, uh, degree of flushing, salivation, physiological responses, and they would combine that with the known traditional uses of a plant. So um, I, I think they're, they're a fascinating group. But so anyway, these were a bunch of competing schools uh, in, in America at the time. Abraham Flexner, although a school teacher, was trained in the scientific method at Johns Hopkins University, which then as now was a bastion of mainstream biomedicine. And he described all other forms of medicine available in America at the time as medical sects. And I shall quote from this paper. Only very few institutions, approximately 20% of those mentioned in the Flexner report, were subsequently able to comply with Flexner's constraints and prescriptions, while most had to shut their doors forever, particularly those in the already medically underserved large rural areas of the American Midwest and the southern states. Now, why is that? Well, I'm going to go to the Flexner report itself, which is also linked in the description box on YouTube. Here's a quote from the Flexner report, written by Abraham Flexner, after uh, going around and surveying these different schools in different parts of America. 
it is speciously argued that improvements thus accomplished will do more harm than good, for whatever makes the medical education more costly will deplete the profession and thus deprive large numbers of all medical attention whatsoever, in order that a fortunate minority may get the best possible care. It is important to forestall this issue, the issue thus raised, otherwise it will crop out at every turn of the following discussion, in the effort to justify the existing system and to break the force of constructive suggestion. So, the, the point about that quote is that um, Flexner is, is saying that um, his report establishes important standards for medical schools and opponents of the report will argue that those standards are going to be very expensive to implement and will result in the closure of other schools and he's saying actually it's important to um, to establish a, a baseline standard and have inferior as he regards them schools shut down and to sort of stamp out that argument well two things firstly as i've already mentioned the actual practical effect of the Flexner report was in fact to shut down many other types of medical establishment, depriving large numbers of people of medical care, exactly as, the, as he's saying in his uh, sort of straw man argument their opponents might say, well that did actually happen after the report. Um, but his, his argument is, is about establishing standards seems on the face of it quite reasonable. Why might it not be reasonable? So there's a paper by Duffy in 2011, again linked in the description box, called The Flexner Report, which gives a bit more detail about the history. So um, commissioned in 1910 and the, the report established the biomedical model as a gold standard of medical training and closed down other schools. Flexner himself and other people behind the report had enormous enthusiasm for the current, the, what was then the German style of medical education, which was hyper rational based on the new sort of scientific model. Um, and created, a, the, the Duffy argues, this created an imbalance in the art and science of medicine. Um, so he describes a little bit of the history of sort of modern biomedicine from the 17th century, the Oxford Circle in the UK, which uh, sort of these uh, eminent physicians and medical people who, and scientific people who instituted the scientific revolution. And in the 20th century, there was what was known as the Hopkins Circle in the United States, which was funded by John D. Rockefeller, the philanthropy of John D. Rockefeller, a name which may be familiar to some of you. So Rockefeller had enormous enthusiasm for the uh, German style of, of medicine and was financially, I believe, involved in some of it as well. And he commissioned Abraham Flexner, this non-medical school teacher who had had a background in uh, scientific training at the time. And he was chosen because he was non-medical, so he'd be seen as a less threatening author, as uh, he, he kind of presented the image of an unbiased author, in a sense, uh, because he was non-medical. Uh, so it's anti-herbal, anti-homeopathic, anti-osteopathic, anti-chiropractic chi chiropractic stance would be easier to swallow, as it were. He was essentially the sort of hatchet man against complementary medicine for the biomedical institution funded by Rockefeller and all that. And it used the Johns Hopkins Medical Center and German medical schools as a template for the gold standard and, and, and used the, their sort of biomedical setup to define the standards of excellence. So what was missing from that? That seems on the face of it, again, very rational. Well, of course, they were using the best of known standard medical care to establish a standard in any, any other type of medical institution which didn't meet those standards would be shut down. Well, 
this is like that classic meme about, you know, you've got, uh, the, the, I think you may have seen it as a cartoon. I might stick it on screen if I can find it, where you've got a whole bunch of different animals lined up and a man sitting at a desk saying, whichever one of you climbs the tree gets the prize or something along those lines. And of course, there's a monkey and then there's a fish and there's all these different other animals that can't climb trees. Well, this is what that report effectively did. It's not judging each school or each medical tradition on its strengths. It's judging it on a particular set of um, faculties that are only apposite to the one they really wanted to quote unquote win or come out on top. So what was not included in that report that perhaps should have been? Mortality statistics. How many patients going to each, going to practitioners in each of those schools, qualified from those schools, died? How many patients died as a result of the treatments received? Missing from the report. Student satisfaction not assessed. Competence of practitioners in medical practice, not assessed. And patient recovery rates, again, from people utilising those different schools of medicine. That may have given a very different result, particularly at the time, because we're talking late 19th century here. Um, obviously, biomedicine has come a long way. I'm not wishing, wishing to cast aspersions on, on those potential statistics now because we've, we've got a lot more sophisticated. But nevertheless, this Flexner report effectively shut down all competition for biomedicine, mainstream medicine in America by shutting down all the other schools and relegating many of them, which were actually not quite at the same level, but, but proffering actual competition, they relegated all of them to the fringe in one fell swoop. Quite an achievement. Um, so the major criteria in the report were admission standards, physical facilities, which were composed of well-equipped laboratories and instruction by scientific physicians. So in other words, you had to have the latest in laboratory equipment and be instructed by biomedical tutors and uh, you had to have these particular types of examination criteria. So if you've got a little herbal school in middle of America, say, and you're teaching on a sort of um, on an apprenticeship type model. So you can take somebody who's had very little education and just teach them in practice. You can teach them about medicine. You can teach them about plants. You don't have a well-equipped laboratory because you're using herbal medicine. So you've just got a few things to maybe make tinctures and um, make teas and store herbs and that kind of stuff. Bit of measuring equipment, no massive swanky laboratories. Um, and you, you may have, your tutors may be trained in medicine, but they may not have been trained in these swanky schools in Europe, that's it, you're done for. You're out because you have failed to meet those criteria. As I say, no attention being paid to the success of the treatments, the satisfaction of the patients, the recovery rate of the patients or the student satisfaction. That was all ignored. So I won't keep repeating it. This report is a huge document in the history of Western medicine because it really established a pattern, which a template, which was replicated all over the world. So that's a little bit of medical history for you and a little bit of a digression, which maybe helps some of you understand why my current anger at the today's situation is for me and I think for many other herbalists and complementary practitioners nothing new aside from the fact that we're kind of used to being called quacks or used to being called basically idiots by mainstream practitioners quite a lot of the time knowing this history and seeing what actually happens in practice is incredibly infuriating and anyway I don't want to bang on about that too much because as I've said before, as I say in the introduction to this channel, I am not an opponent of mainstream medicine. Conventional biomedicine has saved my life twice. I think it's an amazing medical care system, particularly for people who are critically ill. It forms the most sophisticated safety net and in the, the best response to emergency and critical care situations that we have ever had in history. And for that, I am eternally grateful. I just sometimes think it is used in primary care settings where it is 
arguably less appropriate and it is sometimes simply assumed to be the only method of treatment which is appropriate in circumstances where other methodologies may well be more effective. That's my argument. Right, okay, so moving on, I just want to review briefly some other herbal prospects that might be useful in the co-treatment of COVID-19, most of which I have mentioned in my video in 2020, some of which I haven't, but papers on these have come out in, in the last year or two that I just want to go over briefly. So the first one I want to look at is a paper from 2020, and it's about licorice which I've mentioned in my video in uh, 2020. Now, licorice is a very interesting case because, as I mentioned in the video in 2020, it contains a few antiviral compounds. It's also anti-inflammatory. It potentiates natural steroids. And if you're taking steroids, it can make them stronger. So it does have potential side effects, which I describe in my video in 2020. So don't just go out and start taking licorice. It does interact. Many people think it's going to be completely safe because it's the same licorice that's used to make sweets. It's not if you're taking it regularly. It does interact with certain medicines. It can potentially raise blood pressure. It can potentially elevate blood sodium and deplete potassium, which can cause a condition called hypokalemia or hypernatremia, high blood sodium or low blood potassium. And it can also, and it can, that can cause all sorts of other medical problems. And it does, as I say, potentiate steroids. So please do uh, look at my other video where I'll talk a bit about that. And if in doubt, do check with uh, a physician who knows a bit about herbs or a pharmacist who can look it up for you or even better a qualified medical herbalist who can tell you about it. Okay so this paper looked at uh, glycyrrhizae species used in Chinese medicine and found that uh, the, the, the species of licorice in China glycyrrhizae urolensis was found in all almost all the traditional Chinese medicine formulae used in COVID-19 and um, was helpful by a couple of mechanisms. It was anti-inflammatory. Um, the, the specifics of that for anyone interested is it was a toll-like receptor 4 antagonist. Um, and it was especially anti-inflammatory in the heart and the lung, which is, of course, very useful for, um, for COVID. Um, and it caused a, quote, significant reduction in cytokine release, end quote, and, quote, protective effects in acute respiratory distress syndrome, end quote. So what that means is it will reduce that p potential of getting cytokine storm in COVID, uh, particularly the earlier, more, more um, virulent forms of COVID, uh, and, and it would reduce inflammation in the lungs. Uh, it's two of the components in licorice, and by the way, these are these components are also found in the European licorice species, Glycyrrhiza glabra. Um, reduced exp uh, and the two components were, I think, glycerotinic acid and glycyrrhizin, and they reduced expression of type two transmembrane serine protease, um, which is an enzyme. Uh, sort of a, a chemical catalyst, a biological catalyst, actually, that's required for viral replication. The effect of that is they reduced viral uptake. They reduced the ability of viruses to get into cells. They basically inhibited viral infection. And glycerotinic acid, um, by activating aldosterone receptors, these hormone receptors, which can give rise to some of those side effects I mentioned of retaining sodium um, and, and excreting potassium, but so the thing that can cause side effects long term is one of the things that may be helpful in the short term in this condition caused a down regulation of ACE2 receptors uh, in the kidney. So that means there are less ACE2 receptors. These are the receptors that COVID uses to get in to stuff and may do the same in the lung and nasal epithelium, which is obviously in the, in the lungs and in the nose is where COVID would be expected to get in rather than in the kidneys. Uh, so may reduce viral entry points. That's a bit ambiguous. And they found that in the laboratory, in vitro, glycyrrhizin and glycerotinic acid uh, were antiviral against SARS-CoV-2, reduced viral entry to and replication in cells. Um, glycyrrhizin also suppresses 
alternative complement pathway. That means, in English, complement pathway is one of the inflammatory pathways and thereby it would reduce inflammation. And it also, both of those, increased the production of this antiviral protein called interferon 1 beta in upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract cells in the laboratory. So they upgraded the production of these antiviral proteins by cells that would normally be found in the respiratory tract. So several specific mechanisms have been identified in this paper, which was released since my video came out in, in 2020, which is fascinating. So the summary of that is that from this combination of a patient observation, uh, sort of um, case studies in patients who were treated with formulae containing licorice, put together with this in vitro laboratory work, that licorice seems to be effective. We know it's helpful in just from observing its effectiveness in these Chinese medicine formulae. It reduces viral entry points, it reduces airway inflammation, it reduces viral replication and increases genuine antiviral immune responses. Is that through double blind placebo controlled randomized clinical trials? No. But is this a medicine that's been in use for a few thousand years? Yes. Is it a medicine that has been used in actual SARS-CoV-2 patients um, it, with, and with observed efficacy? Yes. Is there a known pharmacological mechanism for all of these things? Yes. So um, as long as one respects the known side effects, then uh, it, it's, it's quite interesting. So the only thing to be aware of there is, is, as I mentioned, there's this potential for raising the blood pressure. But What's interesting here is the authors note that the hypertensive or blood pressure raising effects of licorice may actually be beneficial because SARS-CoV infection, the acute infection, actually causes arterial hypotension. So when somebody has coronavirus severely and it's in the lungs and they're getting that respiratory distress, they usually have... Um, this low blood pressure, interestingly, as a result, presumably, of the body being hypo-oxygenated, low oxygen. So there's vasodilation everywhere because it's trying to get ox as much oxygen to the tissues as, as you can. So that often may lead to a drop in blood pressure. That I'd assume that would be the mechanism. Second report on licorice uh, would be from the Journal of Biomolecular Structure and Dynamics, by, and it's a, a paper by Sinha Al again in 2020. Now, this was just looking at molecules, compounds in licorice, and what receptors, what bits of other cells they might attach to. So it was a sort of, um, I think it was a molecular docking survey where they sort of modelled it with a computer. So in a sense, it's the least useful but it's it's a standard procedure nowadays where we have the computing power to do this to sort of work out which compounds from which plants might be useful for particular conditions where we know what the protein structure of particular receptors on particular cells are and we know what the molecular structure of particular compounds are you can actually using computers basically artificial intelligence which is slightly scary but they're also pretty cool a uh, little bit of both um, you can use them to model which chemicals which pharmacological things might be effective in given circumstances so what they found was that looking at the compound gliaspirin a and glycyrrhizic acid to completely different compounds from licorice, they found that um, glycyrrhizic acid bound to spike protein and prevented virus entry to cells in these models, and that gl gliaspirin A had a high affinity for this other viral protein called NSP15. And using this simulation to tool, um, they found that these other two compounds, Ico I think that's lycochalcone A and isoliquiritigenin, <laughs> it's a tongue twister, isoliquiritigenin, um, were able to reduce acute lung injury. And they actually tested that in mice, in living mice, but using, instead of coronavirus, they used uh, Staphylococcus aureus, so standard bacteria in the lungs, and it reduced lung, those two, that, 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 those two compounds reduced lung injury in the living mice. So... Again, more, more interesting uh, sort of um, tangential evidence for licorice. Uh, another paper by Smee and colleagues in 2021. Um, they found uh, actions of licorice, which may be relevant in COVID-19, antiviral. Uh, so it's a protease inhibitor, which is an inhibitor of a type of enzyme you find in some viruses like HIV. I don't think it's particularly relevant for coronavirus, though. Um, 
Uh, they also have anti-inflammatory and there are a couple of other mechanisms they mention. You can go to the paper and look at it if you want. One of them is uh, versus uh, S pro spike protein binding. That's the one that is relevant for COVID, which I've mentioned from that previous survey, previous paper. Uh, anti-inflammatory activity, various mechanisms for the whole plant. They found it reduces a whole slew of inflammatory cytokines and simultaneously increases antibody responses. It increases IgA, IgG and IgM. Uh, these are different types of antibody immune system proteins which protect against infections. The one that may be most relevant to COVID, I would assume, would be at least initially in the early stages of the infection would be IgA because this antibody really um, is involved in the protection of epithelium that's linings in the nose and respiratory tract and in the gut um, so that was interesting then they also found that the pharmacological actions of licorice it's an antitussive and expectorant meaning it reduces coughing and helps cough up mucus from the lungs um, and is also a bit of an antioxidant those would be useful too and they found that the glycerizing safety there was the issue of the increasing the uh, action of aldosterone this hormone that's called a mineral corticoid that can cause sodium retention and high blood pressure and whatnot um it's it's contraindicated if people have very high blood pressure are taking very high doses of steroids although in a treatment protocol for covid it should be noted that this could be made use of because you want for if somebody has SARS-CoV-2, the kind that puts them in hospital, they've got acute respiratory distress. The standard protocol is to give quite high doses of steroids to reduce lung inflammation. Licorice potentiates the anti-inflammatory effects of steroids. It makes steroids stronger. So that could actually be made use of if, if employed intelligently. It, it, you got to be careful if you've got a patient with high blood pressure. Um, caution on steroids but as i said that could be useful if somebody has heart arrhythmias because of that changing of the balance of potassium and sodium in the blood and heart disease you've got to be careful um i think that's that's it and then there are certain drugs particular ones that you've got to be careful of are ace inhibitors for used for high blood pressure normally diuretics again often used for blood pressure and sometimes used for other things and uh cardiac um, arrhythmia regulators like digoxin and blood thinners like warfarin it can affect and interact with all of those medications pregnant women need to be careful with it and uh, obviously newborn children need to be careful with it so it does have some it's not as problem it's not as um, innocuous as elderberry but it's certainly very useful um, if employed wisely Okay, so the next plant I want to talk about is mulberry. Again, mentioned in my video in 2020. So there's a paper by, I think that's Ingari and colleagues from 2020 on mulberry root. Um, this is from this journal called Bioprocess and Biosystems Engineering. And they were looking at compounds in mulberry roots uh, particularly these compounds called still beans and there are a, a few of these there's mulbericide oxyresveratrol and resveratrol they found that resveratrol in the laboratory inhibited covid spike protein and oxyresveratrol uh, reduced covid viral replication and the, the mulberry root is traditionally used in Chinese medicine. But in the video, I talked more so about mulberry leaf and mulberry um, fruit in medicine, uh, a, a potential use for, for COVID. So the, the other paper I've got here is by Shakya and colleagues from 2021. Um, and in this paper, they, I think, again, looked at in the laboratory, the action of compounds from mulberries. And they found this protein that inhibited the action of an enzyme that facilitated viral cell entry. <laughs> so in other words, compounds in mulberry actually reduce the ability of COVID, at least in the lab, to get into cells. But again, this was a modeling. They used this computer software to model the action of different compounds in mulberry so they, they they found that this that some compounds in in mulberry were able to do that using this computer modeling software but the authors noted quote recent investigation suggests that the efficacy of the water and water alcohol extracts of the leaves and stem bark of morus alba 
that's mulberry, against the viral respiratory infections caused by human coronaviruses and picornaviruses. What that means basically is that the the teas of mulberry leaf and um, tinctures of mulberry leaf and or bark contain these compounds that would be expected to have antiviral effects against coronaviruses. That is amazing because that really backs up what I was talking about in that video in 2020, uh, where there really wasn't that much um, evidence for mulberry. It's brilliant that these researchers used water and water and alcohol, in other words, ethanol, because those are the forms that herbalists or people using herbal medicine would be taking herbs in. They'd be taking a tea or a decoction, the herbs boiled in water, or they'd be taking a hydroethanolic extract, a what's known as a tincture or a fluid extract, in other words, an alcohol and water extract. A lot of these researchers use other compounds like hexane or, I don't know, uh, petroleum ether or other things to extract different chemicals from the plants for the purposes mainly of researching those chemicals in order to produce drugs. But that means the results of those papers aren't necessarily that useful to herbalists and to people who might be using those plants over the counter. So this information is potentially quite useful and interesting. Okay, so the final herb I wanted to talk about is black seed or nigella sativa. This is a herb that I didn't mention in my video in 2020 about the potential use of herbs in, in COVID-19, but there's been a bunch of research done in the past year or so, which I'd like to mention now. So uh, this is from a paper by Islam and colleagues in 2021. Uh, just a review of the pharmacological potentials of black seed or nigella sativa in COVID-19 prevention and cure. Um, I would say treatment rather than cure. Cure is a bit of a strong claim, but anyway, we'll get into that. Um, they mentioned some of the pharmacological constituents of nigella and the research that's been done on those constituents. So you've got the volatile oil, that's like the essential oil of the plant, which contains these interesting quinones, including the most research compound thymoquinone. And then it's also got these isoquinoline alkaloids. Alkaloids are components from medicinal plants that contain nitrogen. They're a very, very heterogeneous group of chemicals, meaning there are loads and loads of different structures, pharmacological structures among alkaloids. The only thing they share in common really is that they contain a nitrogen atom and are not, um, and are not uh, proteins, <laughs> basically. But anyway, uh, enough pharma geekery aside. Uh, the isoquinoline alkaloids, uh, such as nigelidine from nigella, those are the main focus of research in terms of active pharmacological compounds in the plant. Um, as a herbalist, I would say that the whole plant is important because it's not just the motor of the car that matters, it's the design of the chassis and, and the, the, you know, the steering wheel and the whole car. Now, obviously this is a very mechanistic metaphor, but the point here is you can have the best motor that you want, but it, the, the whole car will affect the way the thing as a whole functions. And it's exactly the same with medicinal plants and their components. I won't expand on that now because this video is long enough as it is, but anyway. So what they found is that nigella extract, the extract of black seed, particularly the oil, which is very rich in thymoquinone and these other um, essential oil, volatile oil components, and contains some of the alkaloids as well, is found to be immunomodulatory Anti, in other words, it modifies the function of the immune system, antiviral, and interestingly, anti-ischemic. Ischemia is uh, when you have tissues deprived of oxygen, as for example, when you have a clot that stops the flow of blood to tissues, and you often get a lot of um, injury to those tissues that ironically happens not usually so much during the time when the tissue is deprived of blood, but often when the blood flow returns. It's called an ischemia reperfusion injury. The majority of injury that happens in strokes and heart attacks actually occurs when the blood returns to those tissues, because obviously the tissues have been starved of blood, the cells have all started to fall apart, 
back, figuratively speaking. And then when the blood goes back to those tissues, the oxygen in the blood causes these massive chain sort of redox reactions or oxidation reactions that causes damage. So anyway, some of the compounds in black seed are found to protect against that kind of tissue damage. Um, some compounds in the seed and seed oil called nigelidine and alpha hederin um, in a molecular docking study, the type I mentioned earlier, where they model on a computer how particular compounds from a plant or compounds that have been manufactured may interact with certain cellular processes or, or pharmacological processes. They, those two compounds were found to inhibit SARS-CoV-2. They inhibit the viral, uh, I'm not sure what uh, I think it's the, the ability of the virus to replicate, but you can check the original paper out and see what it says. They basically inhibit the virus, at least on paper. Um, and then they've got some animal studies using poor little live tortured animals in the laboratory where they found that Nigella sativa seed, black seed, um, was able to increase T cell activation. T cells are the cells that coordinate the immune response, so they make those more active, increase macrophage activation. Macrophages are important cells of the immune system. The name literally means big eaters, and they go around eating up invading cells, so obviously that's usually a good thing. And most importantly, I think, with regard to COVID, it, they, the extract modulated cytokine release from leukocytes. What that means is that leukocytes are some cells of the immune system and that when they find uh, an infection, they often signal to other parts of the immune system with cytokines. Too much cytokine activity can result in too much inflammation, which is the cause actually of SARS, of severe acute respiratory syndrome. So you want compounds or drugs or substances or plants that can modulate, that can reduce excessive cytokine release. And it appears that nigella did that, at least in these experimental animals. Um, and you found that with COVID, there's a massive increase in this uh, cytokine called interleukin-6, which it appears that black seed could reduce. Um, also, interestingly, COVID, SARS-CoV-2, suppresses this process called autophagy, which is literally means self-eating, where cells that are damaged or old will sort of, um, will clean up their innards, <laughs> and will eat parts of their insides to sort of clear away rubbish. It's sort of cell cleaning processes, basically. And um, if, if there's a problem with that, that process, uh, you get an increased risk of degenerative disease and cancer. And COVID infection, like some other viruses, some other viruses do this, uh, reduce the efficiency of that self cell cell self cleaning process um, and it's found that the thymoquinone in black seed is cardioprotective by inducing autophagy in other words at least in in the laboratory and in experimental animals thymoquinone from black seed oil was able to protect the hearts of experimental animals by improving, upgrading, upregulating this cell cleaning process that COVID damages. And that I think might have value both for people who potentially have heart problems or palpitations or whatnot after COVID, and perhaps those, those unlucky few who've had um, heart problems such as cardiomyopathy after some of the vaccines. So that's potentially useful. So COVID or vaccine-induced myocarditis could potentially be useful there. Um, also, thymoquinone from black seed uh, might be useful against bacterial resistance because it, it um, reduces biofilm formation. What that means is certain bacteria uh, increase their ability to infect and to not be destroyed by the immune system by forming biofilms. They like clump together. They form this sort of mat that's hard for the immune system to get to, get at. Um, now, what relevance does this have to COVID? It's that if you get SARS or just a long COVID viral infection, people often get secondary bacterial infections because of the prolonged inflammation in the lungs, the inability of the lungs to drain and clear properly secondary bacterial infections can set in. So something like black seed could potentially help to prevent those. Um, so possible use in co-infection to pre prevent as a preventative thing for co-infection in, in the case of SARS. Um, what else to say? They also said in this paper, so that so, Nigella sativa or black seed 
can potentially reduce COVID severity by the following mechanisms. In summary, by increasing the immune response, reducing inflammation, mainly by modulating cytokine release, and also having some secondary antihistamine activity, uh, by increasing autophagy or that cell, cell self-cleaning mechanism, by antioxidant mechanisms, which would help stabilize tissues and reduce tissue damage, and potentially by having some use in comorbidities, because it turns out the black seed oil is somewhat anti-diabetic, it increases insulin sensitivity, um, it's antihypertensive, they lower blood pressure a little bit, and antimicrobial inhibits this bacterial biofilm formation, which might reduce the risk of um, co infections. So, very interesting. So, that's all hypothetical, uh, a little bit of animal stuff. Uh, another paper by Shervani and colleagues in 2021 um, looking at the traditional use of black seed in asthma and lung inflammation. Um, and potentially from this sort of in vitro or laboratory work against the ability of COVID-19 to get into cells. And they propose the hypothesis that a little bit of exercise training and uh, black seed supplementation might be useful for prophylaxis or prevention of COVID. The basis of that is that exercise upregulates immune uh, function, like not too much, but sufficient regular exercise. Um, we all know that. And the black seed looks like it has all these other little uses. So taking it and doing regular exercise might be a useful thing for some people. Uh, they also, the authors also noted that after having COVID, there's often a drop in these T lymphocytes, these blood cells that coordinate the immune response called CD4 cells. This CD4 decline also happens in HIV infection, incidentally, and there's often an increase in inflammation uh, as uh, represented by the increase in the level of this inflammatory marker called CRP. And it looks like, again, black seed oil may help to increase CD4 counts and reduce inflammation. The authors note that there's beneficial effects of nigella sativa on the respiratory system lung parenchyma, narrowing of the airways, and improving fatigue, as well as its anti-inflammatory effects. So in other words, to paraphrase, it seems to improve lung function, reduce inflammation in the airways, and reduce fatigue. So that's really interesting. Um, they, they, there's a little bit more detail in that paper, but that's, that's the basics. Um, and then most interesting to me, we have a clinical trial from 2021 in humans. Yay! Now, it isn't placebo controlled. It was randomized and uh, there was a control group. So in other words, there was a group of patients who were not taking anything other than the standard of care for COVID and a group of patients who were taking standard of care plus um plus black seed oil. So this was a study conducted in King Abdulaziz University Hospital in Saudi Arabia. They used adult patients, all diagnosed with COVID-19, 173 patients in total. The average age was 36 years old. It was slightly more men than women, but roughly equal, 53% males. And they divided them into two groups, just randomized them into two groups so that uh, one group was taking the hospital standard of care. The other group was taking hospital standard of care plus one gram of black seed oil per day in two doses of 500 milligrams each. So 500 milligrams morning, 500 milligrams afternoon, for example. And uh, they excluded from this trial anyone with a history of pneumonia, severe illness, chronic kidney disease, increased liver enzymes, pregnancy, previous use of black seed oil, and most importantly, allergy to black seed oil. You don't want to be taking black seed oil if you're allergic to it. You know, just, uh, just a thought. So they looked at outcomes, uh, that their sort of criteria for outcome was recovery within 14 days. And of course, these are people coming to hospital, so they have quite severe COVID. And uh, they were, there were two groups, roughly the same amount of people in each group, 86 in the black seed oil group, 87 in the control group. Um, 
and they found that they looked at the normal stats for, for COVID uh, patients coming into hospital. They find that 15% under normal circumstances, this was at the time the Delta variant was most prevalent. They found that 15% would usually end up on ventilation and 5% would end up in critical care. This is, of course, patients presenting to hospital. 15% of those might end up on ventilation, 5% in critical care. In the trial... They were expecting, therefore, about 13 patients in each group to end up on ventilation. What actually happened was that four patients in the control group ended up on ventilation and one patient in the black seed group ended up on ventilation and no patients in either group ended up in critical care. This is a really interesting phenomenon. It has to do with the placebo effect, which is really what I call magic. The placebo effect, magic, basically the same thing. Placebo is just a scientific materialist way of saying it. Um, I mean, the difference is that like with placebo, the assumption is there's an underlying materialist mechanistic explanation. For example, the expectations and mindset of a patient will have an effect on their immune function. Whereas with magical thinking, it could be that plus spooky effects, you know, non-material causal stuff. But anyway, that aside, I think of the placebo basically as magic. Um, but what's it's a common phenomenon in trials like this, open trials. This is why they do placebo controlled trials, which are harder to run and much more expensive. But with open trials, you, you usually get a much more significant and even in placebo trials, just the fact that people are in a trial leads to a reduction, a sort of increased efficiency of the medicine. It's kind of like putting people under scrutiny increases the effectiveness of any treatment they're receiving. So it's quite normal for both groups to have a reduced rate of, of problems in a lot of, a lot of cases in, in these trials. It's just a fascinating phenomenon. Um, it's almost like more focus is put on them and therefore they do better. Um, something along those lines. Anyway, the interesting thing here is that there was therefore a, uh, so, so just to give you the more statistics on that, the control group, um, as I said, got four people ended up on ventilators, only one in the black seed oil group. And by day 14, 35% of the control group had fully recovered, but 63% of the black seed oil had, group had fully recovered. So in other words, 28% more people in the black seed oil group had fully recovered within two weeks. So that's significant. Again, it's not a placebo controlled trial. Therefore, the people receiving black seed oil knew they were receiving black seed oil. So there would be a stronger placebo effect. Nevertheless, I think that is still significant enough to sit up and take notice, particularly given what we saw in the animal experiments and what we know about the pharmacology of the plant. Um, the only thing I, I noticed on reading this paper, and I do suggest you, you have a look at it, I've put a link to the full text in the description box on YouTube, of course, is that more symptoms occurred in the black seed oil group on, on the whole, but they also on average disappeared more quickly. In other words, more people in the black seed oil, a larger percentage of patients in the black seed oil experience things like respiratory distress, cough, fever, headache, that kind of thing. So they seem to be slightly more intense in the black seed group, but then they also cleared up more quickly. That I would hypothesize is because of the immunomodulatory nature of the, uh, of the isoquinoline alkaloids and particularly of the timoquinone and the other volatiles in black seed. If they do in fact affect things like macrophage ac activity and T cell coordination of immune function and cytokine release from neutrophils, you would expect perhaps there to be a more aggressive immune response which resolves things more quickly. But the bottom line, of course, is does the black seed oil therefore, with the stronger immune response, lead to this potentially unwanted side effect of cytokine storm? And the answer there seems to be no, because, of course, there is a, a reduction in the rate of patients ending up on ventilators, apparently, and a speedier recovery rate or a higher recovery rate. Or so it seems from this small initial trial. 
So I think that's really exciting. And um, so the, they, the authors conclude that they recommend uh, for prophylaxis or prevention of, of COVID, it might be a good idea just to do regular exercise and to supplement with black seed oil, as long as you tolerate it well and you get on with it, um, at a dose of one gram a day. And they strongly recommend a future placebo-controlled randomized clinical trial. So, because this was an initial pilot open study, uh, further studies are recommended. So that was really interesting. So that's black seed. Perform. I'm just going to finish up with another paper from 2021 by, and I'm probably going to get all of this pronunciation wrong, but by Oesh, Oesh Bartlamovich and Effort or effort. <laughs> in. And this is a paper called Toxicity as Prime Selection Criteria Among SARS Active Herbal Medications. So they basically looked at what plants should be used in COVID. And I quote from the paper, nothing speaks against the immediate investigation on followed by rapid implementation of the following plants for treatment of COVID-19 patients. They looked at a whole bunch of plants and rated them according to their toxicity, potentials for side effects and interactions with other drugs, etc., and narrowed it down to a short list of plants which they felt could be immediately and safely recommended for use in the treatment of COVID. Um, Co-treatment, obviously, with standard of care from hospitals or any other, uh, other medications being used, but because they had low toxicity. So this, these were their suggestions. They suggested mulberry, couple of other plants from Chinese medicine um, and so that was a mulberry was one of their first priority herbs that was one of the plants that I mentioned in my video in 2020 uh, they also mentioned three other herbs from Chinese medicine one of them uh, Japanese honeysuckle Lanicera japonica I haven't mentioned before um, there I don't think there are any human clinical trials on it or but but does look interesting that was used traditionally for asthma and and for lung inflammation so particularly for the not so much for Omicron but for earlier varieties of COVID it might be quite useful and interestingly the European variety Lanicera pericyclamum was traditionally used for asthma as well and for lung inflammation and some herbalist colleagues of mine Karen Lawton and Fiona Heckles of the company Sensory Solutions I'll try and link their blog below as well, um, if I can find the link to that. They, they were recommending the use of honeysuckle lin linicera as a potential, potentially useful herb in, in, in COVID co-treatment back in 2020 as well. So anyway, that aside, amongst herbs that I've mentioned before, they... Uh, mulberry is one of their first ranked herbs so immediate implementation and ranked in the second priority they've got licorice licorice because of its side effects which i did discuss at some length in my video in 2020 but um that top candidate they've got as honeysuckle this is the japanese honeysuckle honeysuckle but i feel that a lot of this could apply also to the european honeysuckle so they're talking about lanicera japonica but I feel a lot of this could apply to Lanicera pericyclamum because much of the chemistry of the plants is the same from what I, I, I've seen. Um, but they say Lanicera is a top candidate, I'm quoting from the paper, due to virtual docking experiments on over 40,000 drugs showing excellent binding capacity to critical target molecules of SARS-CoV-2, uh, including the spike protein, the nuclear capsid protein, and this other protein called 2O ribose methyl transferase, which is just another protein in, in, in COVID. Um, but and also the plant having an excellent safety profile and its traditional use in lung inflammation and asthma. So on that basis, they say, why should this not be immediately implemented? Given what I talked about at the top of this video, the um, precautionary principle risk benefit ratio, it seems favorable from all of those angles. So I'll just quote their summary, their summary points. They say the potential advantages for patients' welfare and public health benefits include one, enlargement and diversification of pharmacological options. If other drugs are not available, not tolerated or not effective. Two, they, these plants are available for over-the-counter use by patients themselves for, or, uh, for oral activity 
um, for, and are very good for financially disadvantaged populations, particularly in developing countries. I would say they're therefore useful for anyone, anywhere, financially disadvantaged or not. I mean, it's a very relevant point that for many parts of the world who perhaps cannot afford or don't have access to expensive pharmacological treatments, it would still be that the plant, these plants could be a really useful primary care modality. Um, and given their good safety profile, they should be implemented immediately. Um, point three, therapy optimization is possible due to complementary synergistic or adjuvant treatment. In other words, if these plants were more, were better researched and were implemented in protocols, you could actually develop really effective protocols using them alongside standard of care treatments to maximize patient outcomes. Why is this not being done? Well, I refer you perhaps to my comments earlier in this video. I don't know if I'm right. I sometimes think Adulting is about living with the cognitive dissonance, about not being certain about anything. I think people who are certain about anything really certain are a little bit dangerous myself, but one can be reasonably confident that using these plants is a sensible thing to do. And number four, they are non-toxic. Even if the effect is only placebo, they are safe and will at least allow a psychological support without causing additional toxic effects. This is, of course, bearing in mind, uh, you know, as long as you're not using any plants that you're allergic to or those plants with known potential side effects such as licorice, you, you, you bear those in mind. They're very, very safe because we've used them for thousands of years. We know what they do. Uh, their pharmacological mechanisms of action are known. They're, they are only slightly only slightly more towards drugs than foods. So on that continuum of sort of food, drug, hardcore drug, <laughs> they're just sort of a little bit away along from foods really. So in many cases. My final thoughts on this are really, um, there it has been for as long as I've been a herbalist and for many, many years before, I think for the whole of the 20th century and perhaps much of the 19th and certainly all of the 21st, a long-term mainstream sort of catch-22 circular logic applied to the um, sort of acceptance of the use of plants in, in therapy, uh, not amongst all doctors or all ca healthcare providers. Many are very interested in the use of medicinal plants because a lot of doctors and, and medical people are pragmatists. They just want to use what works for the patients. But I find that there's a very strongly rooted ideological bias against the use of plants, which I've talked a little bit about the history where some of that's come from. Um, and that really militates against widespread public use of herbal medicines in primary care, which in my view, and I've given hopefully some intimations of, of why I think that is, is very sad and very bad for public health. That's the little catch-22 circular thing involving profit funding, lack of incentivization, um, and, and just it's, it's like there's not enough evidence and uh, nobody can get funding to try them, so there's not enough evidence, so we can't use them. So on and on it goes. So I think one of the silver linings for me of this horrific pandemic um, is that it's really exposing, in my view, some of the corruption in the medical and pharmaceutical industry. Um, and really, corruption is a very strong word, but certainly vested interests. In terms of other treatments for COVID and sort of safety concerns for current treatments, you know, th these, these, these issues have become mainstreamed really. They're, they're not widely reported in the media, but they're certainly being discussed amongst pretty much everyone I know. Um, and I think that's a really good thing because we're becoming aware that ha to what extent, if, if in the midst of a global pandemic, profit can have this much of a distorting effect on medical ethics, then that really reveals a great deal of rot, I would say, in the system. So, but as a herbalist, for me, I think it's important to acknowledge and, and to use as a sort of springboard for, for further, um, not only further investigation, like clinical trials, uh, which I hope we'll, we'll see more and more of in plants in the future, but also just 
as this last paper I talked about, the toxicology report, but for the immediate use in primary care of many plants. If they have a good toxicity profile, they're traditionally used for a problem, then there is no ethical reason not to use them straight away. If we know how they work and there's, they're safe and there's a long traditional use, as long as they can first do no harm, why not use them straight away and gather evidence along the way? So, um, you know, in terms of building on the evidence base, we've got obviously pharmacological information. We have that on most medicinal plants already, like in terms of the known chemistry of the plants, a little bit of lab work, these molecular docking things that are happening now um, in vitro. So lots of lab work um, and some trial support. Some, some plants have clinical trials, but obviously they are expensive and uh a lot of the ones for plants are very small and limited and many of them don't have a placebo group because again funding but more of those would be great so really my conclusion is we need to be implementing more plants in primary care more medicinal plants particularly where they have a long history of use they're known to be safe and and um, there is no rational reason not to use them Anyway, that is my argument. That is why elderberry makes me angry. <laughs> um, but I, I hope for anyone who's stuck with me all the way through to the end, thank you. Uh, please do like this video, share it with anyone who you think might find it useful or interesting. Um, and please do subscribe if you're not subscribed already. Um, and yeah, I hope you took something good away from this video because I think there's a lot of hopeful stuff in here as well as expressing my frustrations <laughs> anyway thank you and uh, hopefully see you next time bye